And welcome to another edition of the Hank Unplugged podcast, the podcast that is committed to bringing the most interesting, informative, inspirational people directly to your earbuds. And I hope that if you really love this podcast, your rate and review makes a big difference. One of the recent ratings that I just read as I walked into the studio today is from Alan, who says, congratulations in reaching episode 100. I think I've listened to all of them over the last couple of years. You and your guests have been a great blessing. And that's the whole goal, is to be a blessing to not only the body of Christ, but to be informational to the population of the world as well. And this is a podcast that is now reaching around the globe, making a difference for time and for eternity. I have a very, very special guest today. Can't wait to get into the interview. Her name is Jackie Hill Perry. She's an incredible writer. She's a poet, an artist. And for the last 12 or so years, she's been using her gifts to authentically share the light of the gospel. She's the author of a book of the month. This is a book that we have been promoting as one of our books of the month. And uh, you can get your copy for your support of the Ministry of the Christian Research Institute on the web at equip.org. And you can also just talk to one of our resource consultants at 888 and the letter C-R-I, or you can write me at Box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, zip code 28271. The book, Gay Girl, Good God, is the story of how Jackie once was and how God has always been. And I think this is an extraordinary book for a number of reasons, including the fact that a poet has composed this book. She appreciates words, she has an affection for phrases, and she has a way of correlating these words and phrases to evoke images and memories and emotions. Jackie is now wife to Preston, she's a mother to Eden, in autumn, and I heard through the grapevine that she has another child, probably undesignated at this point in terms of name, another child on the way. Jackie, it is a delight to have you on Hank Unplugged. Well, thank you for having me. It should be fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. You once embraced both masculinity and homosexuality. Now you embrace God. Talk about that. Yeah, uh, by masculinity... I mean, uh, as early as I could remember, probably, you know, kindergarten, I felt like I was unable to kind of embody the kind of femininity that was displayed in front of me. I didn't like pink. I didn't want to wear dresses. I didn't care about playing with Barbies. And so I naturally kind of just drifted towards or uh, had an affinity for things that were called masculine, while at the same time, I'm also dealing with same-sex desires not knowing where they came from, not knowing what to do with it, not knowing who to talk to about it until I found Jesus. But in the meantime, I had to struggle through all kinds of identity issues on my own. Mm -hmm. Today, more than at any point in human history, it would be easy for you to combine Christianity with the cultural conception of sexuality. You didn't do that. You didn't conform to the culture. You went against the grain of the culture because you wanted to be true to a biblical worldview. I think that's something that is laudable, but also, I think, an opportunity for you to exhort the body of Christ to do just that, as you have so admirably done. Yeah, it's it's difficult because the culture, one, is loud, the culture is consistent, and there are elements of the culture's arguments as it relates to sexuality that do appeal to us as humans. And what I mean is, uh, when someone says, you should love this person, you're right. I should. I I should dignify and honor someone made in the image of God. But at the same time, what I cannot do is affirm or delight in or promote a kind of love that seeks to undermine our primary call to love God above all. And so I think that's the tension that we constantly live in, is how do I love God and neighbor um, in such a way that God would be honored and people will be dignified. 
Yeah, and that's a major theme in your book. The issue here is less about sexuality than it is about loving God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, we were created to love Him. We were created to serve Him. We were created to honor Him. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey me. He tells the, the religious leaders that, you know, the greatest two commands are love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself, and that the law and the prophets hinge on these two things. And so I think the emphasis has to be more about God than it is about sexuality, because uh, even the scriptures, the Bible does not start with Leviticus 18. The Bible does not start with Romans 1. The Bible does not start with 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. It starts with the reality that in the beginning, God created. And if God created, and we are creation, then that means we are automatically subject to the Creator. But there's so much joy um, in being able to walk alongside Him and with Him and honoring Him uh, for His glory, because that's what we were made for. Um, we're doing a disservice to our own self <laughs> to think that we can find any happiness apart from God, which is what C.S. Lewis used to say. You are a consummate wordsmith, and I mean in the sense that when you read your writing, it is poetic. The way in which you weave together words is an incredible gift. And I bring this up not just to praise your writing, but also to make the point that the LGBT culture has been masterful in using words as well. And I think we're in the midst of a word crisis that threatens to undo Western civilization. They are using words and images masterfully. For example, you were just talking about Genesis. In Genesis, we learn about the rainbow as a symbol that God sets in the sky to assure us that the world would not be destroyed again through a flood. That symbol now has been co-opted as a universal symbol for same-sex sexuality. Talk about the power of words. I mean, considering the fact that the world exists because God spoke it into existence kind of signifies how powerful words are. Proverbs is full of all kinds of exhortations and reminders of what words can do. James talks about how we as a people should not use our tongue to bless the Lord, and yet at the same time curse our neighbor because they're made in the image of God. And so words are significant. I think I think even talking about words kind of segues into talking about stories, because one of the most powerful things that Christians and non-Christians have on their side is the ability to tell a story. And so often it isn't that people are believing in a contrary sexual ethic because they've been convinced it's true theologically usually it's because they've been told or seen or a part of a particular story that then appeals to their affections and their passions. And so I think for one of my aims, and I think someone like a Christopher Yuan and a Rosario Butterfield, I think or Sam Alberry, I think all of us are seeing that, man, to, to tell a testimony or to tell a story is to have a counter narrative to what the culture is presenting in the same way. Let's talk about your personal story, the story of your conception and near abortion. You are in this world for a reason. You know that you're marked out as someone created in the image and likeness of God, and that the very fact that you are alive is a function of God's mercy and His grace, and it serves to enhance His glory. Mm. Yeah, when my mother got pregnant with me, she did not intend to be <laughs> pregnant with me. And so she kind of went in between two ideas, which is abort her or give her away. And one of her friends who isn't a Christian, but obviously said a very Christian thing, which was, is it possible that God wanted you to have this baby this way? And my mother told me that it was something about that statement that just kind of humbled her and sobered her up to say, you know what, I'm going to keep this baby. And so I think God used her friend to just speak to the sovereign goodness of God in, you know, the inception of me. So here I am. 
Yeah, and so as someone that nearly experienced abortion, you still would have existed because we're body-soul unities and we're going to exist forever in the presence of God. And when Jesus returns a second time, the aborted will take on flesh, immortal, imperishable, incorruptible, the non-corporeal aspect of our humanity, again, united with the corporeal aspect of our humanity. So we will exist forever. I think perhaps as someone who was nearly aborted, you can speak to the issue, Jackie, of how this is, as Francis Schaeffer once said, the watershed issue of our day, because it has to do with a foundational plank of humanity, which is the very foundational plank of life. Yeah. I mean, I think one of our fundamental issues is autonomy. That's a part of pro-choice, right, is that I have the right to do with my body as I please, which is very similar to those who are advocates of, you know, sexual freedom. It's to say, I have the right to do with my body as I please, which is hard when you do not have the wisdom of God, you know, that makes perfect sense to say, I should be able to do what I want, including if I don't want this baby, if I don't want what is inside of me, I should be able to have the freedom to do away with it. I think the difficulty or the challenge of all Christians is to remind people that your body does not belong to you, and the body inside of your body does not belong to you. (laughs) And so you don't have as much freedom as you do. The only being in the entire universe who is absolutely free is God. But we should submit to God because that's a good thing. And life matters. Image bearers matters. And usually when people have allowed or been willing to listen to a contrary wise opinion other than their own as it relates to keeping a child, they come to realize that the baby brought them joy, joy that they were unable to see when they were believing the lies of the culture. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. I want to talk a little bit about frame of reference, because your frame of reference was dramatically impacted by three men, by your father, by an abuser, and by the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Anthropos, the God-man. I want you to parse that out, explain to those that are listening in how significant a father is in the formation of a child how significant abuse is in terms of how it degrades someone who is made in the image and likeness of God, and how significant the Lord Jesus Christ is in making us whole? Yeah, it's a very good question. I think for me, I think it was as I grew up and got therapy and was able to see some of the like fruits of abuse and fatherlessness in particular is where I saw how significant it was you know, to see how much it changed me and uh, shaped the way I see the world, see myself, see sex, see marriage, see friendship, see intimacy, see vulnerability, trust. All of these things have been tainted by sin, of course, but by sins against me. I think with my dad not being there, you literally have a piece of yourself that you don't understand. There's so much of myself that I'm not fully aware of because I don't have a dad to ask, hey, did you do this too? Do you ever think like that? Why, why am I creative? Did I get that from you? Like, I don't, I don't have the ability to be able to ask those questions. I think with abuse, in particular, what that did was when you pair that with fatherlessness, and I think I talked about this in the book, one of the things my therapist helped me see is that one of the first times I was touched by a man was in an abusive situation. So my entire framework for intimacy was abuse was oppression, was being taken advantage of. And I think the beauty of Jesus is that I've come to realize that there is a man that exists that will never take advantage of me. There is a man that exists that has power and dominion and authority, yet with all of this power that he has, he actually didn't count equality with God the thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, meaning all of the power that he has, he's never used against me, but actually to serve me. And so that doesn't mean and I don't still have to deal with all of the issues and problems and traumas of abuse and fatherlessness because I do. But I do have a hope that extends beyond this earth that I that I have to trust in, you know? Yeah, and I found it fascinating and instructive that in your book you point out that your lesbianism was not a function of sexual abuse, of being fatherless, but rather was a direct result of sin. And this is a theme that runs through 
the entire fabric of your book and your writing. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that that isn't a thing for others. But as for me, I think sin... So the thing is, I think before I recognized that I was fatherless and before I was abused, I dealt with same-sex desires. I think what the fatherlessness and the abuse did is that it gave me more reason and more uh, gave me a, more evidence, bad evidence, but evidence for why I should trust women emotionally and intimately and sexually over and above men. I think it's typical for us to blame nurture as a reason for the things that we deal with, and it is a factor. But ultimately, when I stand before God, and if he did call to mind those particular sins, I could not blame anybody other than my own heart. And so I think that's what I wanted to point out. It's like, nah, like we sin because we're sinners. But some of the sins in which we walk obviously are exaggerated because of the sins that have been committed against us. Another point that you make emphatically in your book, you talk about the role of conscience in conversion. And I thought that was powerfully stated. I mean, we know that there's a God because... His eternal power, divine nature, are clearly seen through what has been made. And Christ, of course, came in human flesh. And the evidence for his coming and his resurrection are indisputable. But the role of conscience is very, very powerful in bringing us to God. We try to mask our conscience. We try to dilute our conscience. We try to cover it up. But conscience, if we ever get to the point of exposing ourselves openly to it, can be the cause of our conversion. You're exactly right, which is terrifying. Terrifying to the unbeliever, that is, because I think what the conscience does is the conscience reminds you of truth. One of the things that were um, particularly frustrating for me is that I grew up kind of in church. My household wasn't Christian, but I went to church every weekend. And so what my conscience was uh, or consisted of all of the truths that I heard about Jesus and sin and righteousness and heaven and hell as early as five, six, seven. So when I'm 16, 17, 18, my conscience is reminding me of these truths that I learned 10, 12 years ago that I could not shake to the point that I actually began to just want God to let up, to just leave me alone. I didn't want to be convicted. I didn't want to know that I was sinning against God. I didn't want to be aware that I was guilty. But in essence, it was as if I was asking God to make me a reprobate, make me unfeeling, make me unaware of the truth of my state before Him. But in His mercy, He used the conscience by the power of the Spirit to just make me submit to the truth instead of running from it. Jackie, how do drugs help you keep God in the background? So my drug of choice was marijuana. I think what it did is that it it helped me not to have anxiety about my eternal state before God. And obviously people do weed and other things for all kinds of reasons. But for me, it was when I say my conscience was loud, I mean it. <laughs> and so I would get high simply to not have to think about what it was that I was doing and what the consequences might be. And that's obviously, it works for a short amount of time, because as soon as it lifts, there is God. <laughs> there he is, still speaking, still reminding you of the truth. And so I'm just grateful that God is so consistent. You have eloquently stated that God did not call you to be straight, but rather God called you to himself. In other words, the pinnacle of the Christian faith is not heterosexuality. The aim is to know Christ, to honor him, to love God with your whole heart. And I think that's something that bears elaboration. Yeah. When I was going to church, and I think the way this is phrased is different depending on context and culture, but when I was going to church, a lot of things, when any time like uh, lesbianism or homosexuality was brought up, they would equate salvation from homosexuality with a heterosexual marriage or heterosexual experiences, which is like when you come to Jesus, he'll make you straight. Or you see that girl over there, you should, you know, talking to a boy, you, you should get married to her and have a regular family, whatever. And I think I get it. I think we're pulling from God's design and creation to say this is the normative way 
in which relationships and sexual intimacy should be expressed between one man and one woman. But I also think it's being unfaithful to the scripture to present a kind of gospel that says, come to Jesus to be straight rather than come to Jesus for Jesus. Because what happens then is, is if I'm coming to Jesus for anything other than Jesus, I'm not actually coming to Jesus. I just acquired another idol and placed Christianity on top of it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the problem with this language is that we are not highlighting our relationship with Jesus and God as the primary aim of our repentance. Uh, marriage, heterosexual marriage in particular, uh, well, that's the only marriage that there is, but <laughs> marriage will not exist beyond this earth. It will be done away with because it's simply a pointer. It's a mystery pointing to the reality of God's love for his church. And that is a marriage that is eternal. And so I think greater emphasis should be given to coming to Jesus, to love Jesus and being married to Jesus. And in being married to Jesus and loving Jesus and serving Jesus, it does not mean that I will not struggle. It does not mean that I will not be tempted. What it does mean is that I have a great high priest who Mm. says that when this stuff does happen, you have a throne of grace to come to. (laughs) And so I think that. That makes a much more realistic picture of Christianity to me. Yeah, let's sort of stick on that subject for a moment. You point out the error of believing that only a fraction of our humanity needs saving, when in reality Christ came into the world to save the entirety of our humanity. Mm-hmm. You underscore that in many different ways, and I think you ought to do that again on this podcast. Yeah, I remember when I first started in ministry, maybe 12 years ago, I had a YouTube video come out about my story and a girl wrote me on Facebook and she said, you know, you're being homophobic, et cetera, et cetera. And I asked her the question. I said, hey, let's say uh, homosexuality, because she professed to be gay and saying that, you know, God loves her as she is gay and et cetera. And he does love her, but he doesn't love sin. And so I said, let's say, hypothetically speaking, let's say homosexuality wasn't even an issue. That Let's take that off the table would God still be pleased with your life? To which she responded, no. What that reveals is, is that these, these small, they're big, but small expressions of our sinful nature are not the only thing that God wants to deal with. My passions, whether that's pride or bitterness or anger or lust or pornography addiction, all of these come out of a heart that is wicked, of a heart that is deceitful. And so when God wants to redeem the person, he does not redeem an aspect of the person. He redeems the entire person. And so in talking to someone who is in the LBGTQ community, it isn't that I just talk about their sexuality. I talk about their heart because I don't want you to just be straight or to just have power over your sexual lust. I want you to have power over everything so that you fully bear the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, all of it, (laughs) you know? God wants all of us, not just a piece of us. That's what you refer to over and over in your book as the era of the heterosexual gospel. Yeah. So the idea is, is that there is a heterosexual gospel, but you're saying that that only truncates the gospel as opposed to giving us a holistic view of the gospel. Correct. Because I do think that there's a tendency to, if you are in the gay community, your assumption is that when someone preaches the gospel, that that's the only thing that the gospel wants to deal with. And so what happens is they think, and I say this out of experience for myself and friends, is someone says repent and you think, oh, I need to just repent of my sexuality. Now they're coming to God thinking that only 10% of them is wicked and 90% of them is righteous. And so if I just deal with this sexuality issue, I should be good to go. But no, (laughs) the whole person is problematic. Um, And so that's what I think. I think when you, when you present a gospel that says, no, your primary problem with God is unbelief, that you refuse to give him your entire self, your body, your mind, and your soul, it actually humbles the person a little bit lower to see that there is nothing then that I could do to make myself right with God nor holy before God apart from his son. Here's a statement I want you to comment on. The statement that homosexuality is a behavior 
it is not an identity. You agree or disagree? Yes, I do think it's a behavior that has become an identity, primarily because of the world in which we live. Even the terms homosexual and heterosexual are not eternal terms. (laughs) They came into being around the 1800s. Prior to that, people did not frame their identity around what or who they were attracted to. It was when we had these terms, heterosexual and homosexual, that then people began to start seeing themselves through the lens of who they like and what they love. And I think it's harmful primarily because I think when you identify yourself by anything, then you tend to give that thing more power than it deserves. I think the primary identity that we should all submit to is that of an image bearer, meaning I was made for somebody. I was made from somebody. And that means that as an image bearer, my primary job and goal should be to glorify God. But our secondary identity because of the fall is that we're sinners. And so because we're sinners now, we want to be identified by everything that is antithetical to the nature of God. And so, yes, I do agree with that. How would you have reacted if I would have introduced you to the listeners on this podcast as an African-American poet and writer, as opposed to a poet and writer created in the image and likeness of God and someone who is incredibly gifted as a writer? I mean, both, well, the giftedness is relative, but both both are true. I wouldn't despise you or feel some type of way about being called an African-American woman because that's who I am. I only would if it was a matter of tokenism, if it was, let me say that this is who she is as a means of saying we're being inclusive and diverse now. But other than that, I would be totally fine with it. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I'm driving at is, and maybe you can help me with this, but for me, when I see a person, I see a person created in the image and likeness of God. And sometimes I feel remiss in identifying someone you know, by their heritage. I'm Dutch. I immigrated here, so I wouldn't want someone to call me a Dutch American. But I'm not saying there's no validity in that. I just wanted your perspective on it. Yeah, I think I think there's a difference, in, and that's understandable. I, but I think as Black people and as an African American, I think that our identity matters so much because of how much it's been repudiated in this world. Well, not just even this world, in this country. I think ethnicity is just as glorifying to God as righteousness with Christ is. You know, it appeals to the diversity and the creativity of God. Mm -hmm. And when we are in heaven, our ethnicity, as you know, will not be done away with. You know, tribes, tongues, and nations will exist and glorify God. And uh, John felt the need to actually communicate that about what he saw in heaven. And so, yeah, I, I, I get the tension, but I love to say that I'm black. (laughs) Ah, cool. Hey, Jackie, you point out in your book that God did not come into the world to give us joy. You say that God came into the world to be our joy. Underscore that difference. That's my John Piper coming out. But, um, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, I think in the early days of my Christian faith, I kind of only saw Christianity as a practice of duty. You know, God has given his law, God has given his word, I must obey him to make him happy and please him. And all of that is true. We are to obey and love God. But I think God is just as much after our obedience as he is our affection. In Genesis 3, I don't think it's happenstance that as Eve is interacting with the tree, she has an affection for it. It's desired to make one wise. And so I think, I think, that God wants us to want him too, not to simply just obey him. And and wanting him, we're actually wanting the best person that has ever existed. <laughs> you know, at his right hand is fullness of joy. He is God. He is good. He is faithful. He is true. He is righteous. He is just. He is all things that we cannot be in and of ourselves. And so it's difficult for me to ever fathom the idea that to know God is to know someone that won't make me happy. That does not mean that I won't suffer, but it does mean that there is a presence of hope and joy in the midst of my suffering that will lead me into a place called heaven, and heaven is heaven because God is there. 
You had the perception in your book to recognize a metaphor, the metaphor of Christ's burial clause, that he doesn't leave anything unchanged. And you saw that metaphor and the fact that these claws were not scattered around, but they were neatly folded. Oh, you mean uh, when Jesus resurrected? Yes. Yeah, that I remember when I saw that, you know, one, Jesus was being meek. You know, he didn't just resurrect and leave the sheets on the floor. He actually folded them up. Um, but I do think it's telling uh, that that's what Jesus does or that's what the Spirit does when the Spirit comes inside of us and that He cleans us up, you know? Nothing can be the same once you've come in contact into the knowledge of Jesus. Absolutely. I want to talk about an Amazon critical review and your reaction to it. I think we have to react to these reviews, and as authors, we all experience them, but we have to do that with a great deal of grace. And this particular review, I think, personifies that. Here's a lady who says, as a bisexual woman, I felt hurt reading Gay Girl, Good God. Also, I felt hurt for the author. She put so much pressure on herself to find wholeness and the love of God that she changed a prominent aspect of who she is to do so. There are a lot of negative implications associated with that kind of mindset. I believe God loves you no matter who you are. And I found this critical review interesting because so many people said that they found it helpful. But I think what would be helpful is for you to respond to that critical review. Man, I actually appreciate that opinion. It's understandable because I think it goes back to the identity thing is that we see, um, we see, like when, when we have same-sex desires or all these different kinds of passions, they feel so true, so right, so intrinsic to who we know ourselves to be. And so to say that I'm going to lay this aside for Jesus sounds as if I'm saying I'm going to lay who I am aside for Jesus. But that's exactly what Jesus has actually called us to do, is to lay aside the parts of ourselves that do not mirror or image God. And so it isn't self-hatred, as some people would say, but it's self-denial. But also, I would speak to the reality that uh, I think this hurt language is kind of a thing now, and it always has reminded me of the conversation that Jesus had with the rich young ruler, in which he tells him, hey, sell everything that you have and come follow me. And it's kind of like important that it says that he walked away sad, you know? because he had many things. And so he had too much pride in what he had and his stuff to the point that it made him sad that God would say, follow me, the person who was better than everything that you have. And so that's the situation before us, is that God is calling us to a higher standard, a standard that puts him as preeminent above all things, and it's hurtful. It's hard because never is giving up an idol going to be an easy thing to do. But guess what? On the other side of relinquishing those idols is actually the joy that we thought that those idols would bring us. And so that's my response to that. Let's go back to the time that you're a practicing lesbian. In the book, you talk about how you used to dress as a lesbian. And I'm wondering if you can express the correlation between that way of dressing, and how you acted, both privately and publicly. So, for example, when you fell in love with Preston, you started dressing differently, and that dressing differently, the way you expressed it in your book, had a whole impact on your being. Hmm. Yeah, I think gender and clothes and all of that is a super nuanced, complicated conversation. I think, for me, I had a level of gender confusion early on. Mm -hmm. And I think what I, I think some of it is that the, the version of woman that the culture and people around me were telling me that I was supposed to be is the version of woman that I was not created as. Because the version of woman that is presented is women are soft-spoken. Women are emotional. Women, again, like pink. Women like to play with certain things. Women cook. None of these things are actually gendered 
or gender specific as told to us by the scriptures. And so what happens, I think, a part of the confusion that we are now seeing throughout the world is that people have been thinking that the gender that they should embody is a caricature instead of seeing that the unique ways in which God has made them as a man and as a woman does not make them less man or less woman. Just because a boy might be more emotional does not mean that he is acting like a woman. It means that he is being human. It means that he is made in the image of God, a God who feels and responds to these feelings. Jesus wept. And so I think when I learn to see myself through the lens of Scripture instead of through the lens of culture as it relates to my gender and my gender identity, that kind of freed me up a bit. And so even when I married Preston, I didn't start wearing dresses. I still don't wear dresses. I didn't start, you know, wearing nails. I still don't wear nails. But I I actually know that none of those things make me more or less woman. I am a woman because God said I am. I am a woman because my biology speaks to it. And so, yeah, but I think as when when I was a a non-Christian, that's what you were seeing, is that you're seeing a person wrestling between oh, because I'm a little more assertive, let me just go the full extreme and dress like a boy since they're saying I'm acting like a boy anyway. When it's like, no, being assertive doesn't make you masculine. It just makes you assertive. (laughs) Yeah, and that speaks to another issue that you comment on, and that is that same sex attraction for you was as natural as smiling. And a lot of people see that as unnatural, but when you were... A practicing lesbian, that attraction was natural. Yeah, because it's, it's unnatural biblically as it relates to God's original design. Romans 1 says that it's unnatural. But as a sinner, it felt natural in the same way that someone who deals with lust, you see men, or I see men all the time, a woman who might be beautiful walk past, And they can't even help but turn their head, turn their neck to look at her body, to objectify her. I don't think in that moment they feel like it's unnatural. They feel like as a man, I should be able to observe and admire a woman's body, right? And so I think in the same way, that's all that I was experiencing is that the sin, the particular sin that I was dealing with was a sin that felt natural to me, which apart from the spirit and apart from truth, it kind of affirms this idea of, I was either born this way or this is who I am and this is what I should do. But I think as I got the scripture into me with discipleship and community and prayer and all those things is when you learn that just because something feels natural doesn't mean that it is natural. And it takes faith to believe that. I'm going to tempt you to give a sermon here, but talk about the significance of the church in all of this when we're talking about same-sex and sexuality. Yeah, I mean, the church is who who helped me to walk with God and understand God. I became a Christian at 19, you know, and prior to that, I didn't trust the church because the church had never really been trustworthy in my opinion. But when I joined a particular local church, the way these people love me and by love me, not just love the ex lesbian me, you know, they loved me holistically, Jackie, and they saw gifts in me and encouraged it. They saw the things that I needed help in and called it out but they didn't just call it out. They actually helped me walk it out. Um, And then I was discipled by a woman named Santoria. And I think apart from discipleship, I don't know where I would be. I think I would still be a Christian, but I don't know how fruitful of a Christian I would be, you know, because Santoria was the first person to tell me, Jackie, the way that you fight lust, the way that you fight sin, the way that you fight pride is with the gospel. What Jesus did 2,000 years ago did not just save you, but it also keeps you. And so you need to be reminded of the power of the gospel today, in this moment, with every trial and temptation. And so I think apart from having women and pastors and preachers and deacons even and elders and all of these things, to even being able to drink wine and the cracker or bread, depending on what kind of church you go to, and to be reminded of the broken body of Jesus and the blood that was shed for our sins. I just don't know how I could continue to exist as a Christian without other Christians. And that's the beautiful thing about the church. Yeah, I talk about the church as the center of the universe, and you mentioned the Eucharist. The real presence of Christ in the Eucharist is something that transforms us from one grace to another. And so the church is axiomatic in dealing with a culture 
that has gone off the rails. And if the church doesn't lead on the issue of homosexuality and lead in a proper way, then the culture is going to continue to devolve. And that's one of the reasons I love your book. Your book gets back to the issue that you alluded to earlier, that the danger of a homosexual trying to pursue heterosexuality is the danger of trying to pursue one thing in place of another, heterosexuality in place of holiness. And if you do that, as you alluded to earlier, you're just replacing one idol with another idol. Yeah, it's true. I think the church, we are ambassadors. We are representatives of what God is like and what God demands on earth. Matthew 28, the Great Commission, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And I think maybe, perhaps, that's why there, I think, is such a demonic attack on what it is that Christians believe, because we are confusing people. (laughs) If there's not a consensus on what is orthodox and what is heretical, but I think God is preserving us as He promised that He would. I think that it might be a remnant, but there is a large amount of us that will continue to believe the truth of what the Scripture has to say about sexuality, about the body, about God, and about what it means to be faithful. One of the issues that you uncover in your book is the issue of pornography. There was a point in your life where you loved pornography, and yet there's a stereotype that porn is solely a male problem. Can you elaborate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean... I've spoken at enough conferences and met with enough women behind the scenes to know that it's definitely a female and a male problem. I do think statistically it seems to lean more on the male side, but that isn't to negate the fact that women struggle with it as well. And I think for different reasons. I just, I think one of the things that grieves me most about pornography apart from the fact that it's connected to sex trafficking, the objectification of women, the perversion of what sexual intimacy is to be, what it does to people in their minds. Like, I remember when I I realized that it isn't just my sexual abuse or sexual trauma that shaped how I understood intimacy in my marriage. It was also pornography, because in pornography, all I saw was women being treated a particular kind of way that did not look or seem God honoring. And so when I went into my marriage, it was hard for me to actually reckon with the idea that my husband did not see me as these men saw these women, you know, or that he would not treat me as these men treated these women. And so it, it literally is a discipleship of the mind in such a perverse way. Um, yeah. I don't even have much to say about it, except that it's sad. On another note, are you still tempted by same-sex attraction? In other words, when you come to faith in Christ, is that just suddenly poof gone? (laughs) No, absolutely not. I remember a woman, she came up to me after I taught on sexuality at a Christian thing, and she said, hey, are you still tempted with women? I said, are you married? She said, yeah. I said, are you still tempted with other men on occasion? She said, yeah. Yeah, I never thought about that. <laughs> so, yes, it's still a temptation, but I wouldn't say that it's a temptation that is heavy. And that's not to say that it won't be heavy at some point, because I've seen how temptation can kind of grow in intensity and wane depending on the season of life that I'm in. But I think at this point, 12 years in Christ, I struggle with pride more than I struggle with my sexuality. You know, I struggle with humbling myself to apologize first more than I struggle with homosexuality, but it's still a struggle. Um, And that doesn't define me because I'm not defined by what I'm tempted by. I'm defined by who I submit to, which is Jesus. And so I think having that perspective has helped me to not be discouraged by the things that show up in my heart. One of the things that might define you is your poetry. And, uh, you know, I have 12 kids, so I'm way ahead of you, Jackie. You're, you you're think on, well? Yeah, you're only on your third. God bless so. you. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> anyway I, I know you're trying to catch up. But your poetry, and the reason I brought that up, by the way, is that one of my sons is a poet. He loves writing poetry. But poetry seems to be a lost art. Mm. At least I'm not as familiar with people that are poets as I am with preachers and writers. I know that's a passion of yours, and I want to explore that with you. 
Yeah, I think it's a lost art depending on where you live. I think where you live and how you were raised, perhaps, I don't know. Because I think in certain cultural contexts, it's a thing. So L.A. or New York, Chicago, very artsy cities. It's, it's what the people live and what the people breathe. When I moved or visited the South, I realized that that art form wasn't as predominant as in other places. And so I think that's the thing. But I think when you look at the Bible, even, the biggest book of the Bible is poetry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, And God uses it to glorify himself. He uses it to rebuke people. He uses it to give calls or means of confession. And so I think what modern spoken word is, is that we're following in a long line and lineage of people who have used words, uh, specifically creative words, metaphors, similes, puns, double entendres, etc., to simply point to Jesus in the same way that the prophets and the psalmist did. It was beautiful. I'm going to try to catch you off guard. Is there any way you can lapse into some poetry? Probably not. I've been teaching so long, I don't remember any of my poems. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, you used to do this on stage, right? I used to, yeah, uh, like a year ago. Does Preston still do it, your husband? Uh, well, before the pandemic, he was doing it more than, than me. But yeah, we both have the ability to do it, but our focus has been more, his, his thing is apologetics, and me, I'm working on a book about holiness. And so we've both been in these academic settings so much, which, which can starve the creativity out of you, which is interesting. And so, yeah. So you obviously recognize the power and significance of apologetics, always being ready to give an answer, a reason for the hope that lies within us, and to be able to do that with gentleness and with respect. You're an apologist in a sense. Your book is an apology. It's a defense. And I think one of the things that people forget is in the early Christian church, you not only had the apostolic fathers, but then you had the great apologists, you know, apologists for the faith who were able to defend the faith because the faith was under attack in the early centuries of the church, just as it is today. And so your husband recognizes the need for all of us to be ready to give an answer. Oh, yeah, because there's always questions. A lot of people are asking questions. And he, I know one of the missions of his heart, and even mine, in a different way, is that Christians would be equipped to answer these questions, you know. Because the thing is, is people, whether it's Jehovah's Witnesses, whether it's Mormons, whether it's atheists, whether it, uh, in the black community we have the Nation of Islam, uh, Moors, uh, black Hebrew Israelites, a lot of times these people are much more studied than we are, <laughs> which is a problem. And so I think the, the task at hand is to just remind Christians that we do have the ability to be able to defend our faith. We don't have to go to seminary. Seminary is helpful. But we have a Bible, we have the Spirit, and we have a community that have trained us to be able to look through the Scriptures, know what it says, so we can defend why it's worth believing. Yeah, I was fascinated by the fact that when I brought up poetry, you immediately pointed out that the largest book in the Bible is rife with poetry. It is poetic. Maybe you can comment on the fact that many Christians not only don't know how to give answers, but they're not in love with the Word of God anymore. Your answers have been biblical. Many times, as I ask you a question, you immediately relate that question to an answer that's given in Scripture. Maybe it is good for you to underscore the passion we ought to have in the 21st century for an enduring treasure, which is the Word of God. Yeah, I mean... (laughs) Not to quote scripture, but to quote scripture, it's profitable <laughs> for correction, for rebuke, for training and righteousness. The word is the means by which I'm able to see and understand and know God. And so it isn't that I love the Bible just to love the Bible. It's that I love the Bible because I love God. And I recognize that the only way for me to be clear on who he is and how I'm supposed to respond to the revelation of who he is in the scriptures and as seen in his son is by knowing his word. I think there is a distinct attack on all of us as Christians and even in a different way on women to not spend as much time in the word as we ought, maybe because of boredom and usually because of insecurity, feeling as if we're not equipped enough to be able to understand it and spend time in it. And 
I would bet that there is something happening even with our abilities to endure in, in the world because of social media. I find it so much more difficult to pay attention now than I did 10 years ago. My mind is going to Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or whatever the case may be. And so we even need the power of the spirit to have self-control as we study so that we're just not these Christians who are biblically anemic, if you will. Like we need to have a thorough and a deep, deep knowledge of God's word to be able to withstand in the evil day because it's here. Where do you think a good place is for people to start? Years and years ago, People used to always say, start by reading the Gospel of John, and I don't disagree with that, but you're saying that there's a sense in which you can become intoxicated by reading the Psalms or reading the Proverbs. Yeah, where would I start? Well, John is my faith, <laughs> one of my favorites, uh, because the, the nerd in me says, hey, start in Genesis and just move through that thing. But I think seeing Jesus, and even when you see Jesus say in John 5, uh, you know, you read the scriptures thinking that in them you'll find eternal life, but it's they that seek about me. If someone stumbles across that, then that then moves them backwards to the Old Testament to say, oh, this Jesus that I see revealed in John is the same Jesus that David and Isaiah and Jeremiah and all in Moses are pointing to, you know. And so I think John is a beautiful book to start. Speaking of books, let's go back to your book for a moment, Gay Girl, Good God. First thing I want to ask you about the book is, why the title? Uh, it's catchy, one. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think it it was bold, which part of me feels like secular culture is very bold, and so I wanted it to be just as bold as them. But I think it kind of simplifies my entire aim, which is, man— I was a gay girl loved by a good God. And it just seemed to just say it really succinctly in a way that catches people's eye. And it's memorable, even though you have people that accidentally might say a uh, good girl, gay God. But, you know, it's difficult not to blaspheme, I guess. <laughs> you <I'm> know, <laughs> Jackie, I've read your book more than once, which when I find a book that I really love, I read it more than once because it gives me an opportunity to savor the book. What are you trying to get a person to experience by reading your book? What's the motivation? What's the, what's the takeaway? It's two primary aims for two different people, which is for the Christians, I want them to have empathy. I think Jesus modeled empathy perfectly in that he became like us, therefore he can empathize with us and our weaknesses. And a part of that is him embodying this flesh. And so for me, I wanted the book to kind of be a means of people being able to walk in someone else's shoes, for them to see how someone else thinks, how someone else thinks, to see the, the, the different things that happen inside of a person's heart that then motivates the behavior that you're wanting to address. And I think empathy, obviously, is a cousin of compassion. You know, I think the more empathetic you are, the more willingness you are to be compassionate and loving, and not loving in the sense of passive or loving in the sense of not speaking the truth, but I think it's the love and the compassion that then helps you say the truth in the way that God would be glorified and the person would be dignified. The other aim of the book is to speak to those in the gay community or someone who identifies as gay, whether that be the gay Christian, whether that be someone who does not submit to a biblical sexual ethic, but it's to say, hey, here's a book that's more about God than it is about me. And my hope is that what you see about God changes who you believe. So that's the goal. Sort of a lightning round, if you will. Maybe another way of putting it is some quick hits on your book. So I'll just read the statement, and maybe you can comment on that statement or give it some context. You say, God isn't calling gay people to be straight. Why? Because he's calling them to be holy. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, you want me to expand? I mean, that's the essence of it in a word. We are more than our sexuality. Yep. We are image bearers. If we are in Christ, we are new creatures. We are saints. We are God's beloved. We are God's friend. Uh, my sexuality is not the essence of who I am, nor does it make up uh, holistically who I am. I'm more than that, not only for myself, but to God. And so to highlight my sexuality as if it is the apex of human nature and me, 
is to really leave out how complicated and nuanced God has made me to be. Why do you think so many churches today are willing to accept the cultural conception of sexuality? It's easier. Honestly, that, that's one. It is a difficult thing to stand up for something that you will be hated for believing. That is hard. Hmm. Uh, at our core, many of us, don't. we don't like to be disliked. We don't like to be hated, so that's one. Two, I think if we can become loose on uh, God's demands as it relates to sexuality in the sense of homosexuality, then... I think that that will lead us to be loose in sexuality, period. So you may not be gay, but then you start to appeal that maybe polyamory isn't a problem. Maybe adultery is okay. Maybe pornography is justifiable. And so I think it leads us or opens up all kinds of doors for whatever sexual deviances that we are tempted with, that we will try to find some type of biblical justification for that as well. Another statement made in your book, marriage is not the pinnacle of the Christian faith. Yeah, it's not. Jesus is. (laughs) Marriage is a glory. It points to the gospel, but it's not the highest glory. To know God, that is what offers us and gives us eternal life. To know God is what we were created for. To know God is the essence or the primary aim of all of our repentance not marriage. I think next time I introduce you, I'm going to call you not only a poet, but a preacher. Here's another (laughs) statement you make. Singleness is not a curse. It's not. Paul was single. Jesus was single. And most of my friends are single. Um, And they have time and privileges and burdens that are different from me. And if anything, they have room to glorify God in a way that I'm too limited to do because I have a husband, two daughters, and now another baby on the way. And so I don't have the same freedoms in which they do. And so I think however God has us, whether married or single, that's where he has us. And God is wise in where he has us. And so I think in this culture that's dominated by only seeing marital intimacy as the only version of intimacy, it's hard to see that. But man, being single it's just as glorifying to God as being married is. Different, but just as. Your book is not necessarily popular in terms of its message, and perhaps you can comment on the need to be willing to endure persecution. Persecution comes, and we think this is unnatural, but if you think back to the early church, you can think back to Polycarp of Smyrna who was not only persecuted, but ended up dying for his faith. He was not willing to offer incense to the gods. He was not willing to call Caesar God. And so he went to his death. What should be our role, our willingness to face persecution, and through that to demonstrate the reality of the faith once for all delivered to the saints? Yeah, I think one motivation is Jesus and that he was hated and despised and then crucified. And he said, if they hated me, they'll hate you too. And so I think Jesus has already warned us (laughs) that if you want to be like me, then this is something that you have to embrace yourself to deal with. So that's one. And I think two is love of neighbor. I have to love my neighbor enough to offend them for the sake of of them coming to know Jesus. That does not mean that in my saying um, biblical truths that I add offense to offense. That's to say that the gospel is offensive to all who are perishing, but it's also life to all who believe it. And so for me, when I see people, and I know may not like my message, or if I get feedback from people that they are mad and calling me homophobic and all these things, I don't get mad. I don't get angry. It might bother me because they talk about you personally, but at the end of the day, I love them enough to go through that because my hope and my aim is that someday, whether it's today or 20 years from now, that God would use this foolish message of the gospel to draw them to himself where they then become a people who say, man, at one point I was blind, but now I see. And so I think if the goal 
is the preservation of your own comfort, you're going to be timid. You're not going to say the truth. But I think if the goal is to glorify God and to serve the people that God is giving you proximity to, you'll be willing to endure anything. I don't know if I should say for the sake of the elect, but yeah, that's what Paul says. <laughs> well, if Paul says it, and you properly contextualize it, I, I think you can definitely say it. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's an important thing, too, in terms of reading the Bible. You have to learn to read the Bible in the sense in which it's intended. And uh-huh. that's an art, and it's a science. It's a science in that rules apply. It's an art in that the more you apply the rules, the better you get at it. And I suppose that's all part and parcel of what we talked about earlier of falling in love with the Word of God in the truest sense. One last question. Jackie, talk about, and you already have, but bears elaboration, talk about having an eternal perspective as opposed to being focused on the temporary. Yeah. My friends think I'm morbid because I talk about death a lot, (laughs) but it's only because death or what happens after death has become a real, like, source of endurance for me, just continually putting before my face the reality that one day I will see God, you know? Um, And I'm often encouraged, I think it's by, I think it's Hebrews 11, where they go on this whole rant about people who were faithful throughout the scriptures, and they talk about how these people were looking forward to a place, I'm going to paraphrase this because I don't remember the text, but not built by hands. Like, so much of their faithfulness was fueled by the reality that one day they will be somewhere other than here. Mm. And so I think that's, that's the perspective that I have and that I, I think I'm following in uh, faithful people of the Bible and having it too, which is this earth is passing away. We will not be here long. And while I'm here, I want to make an impact, but the impact I make, I wanted to make God happy. And so I want to be able to stand before God one day and not be ashamed. I want to be able to stand before God one day and say, well done. But the reality is, is that because of Jesus and his righteousness alone, that will happen, I believe. <laughs> you know, I will be able to stand before God and not be ashamed and will be approved and will have all of the glory that I miss from people because they're persecuting me. Man, all the affirmation I need is God saying you did it. <laughs> it's like, yes, I'm, I'm here for that. And so, yeah, I, I think that's, that'll help us endure a whole lot, you know. Jackie, I was diagnosed with stage four mental cell lymphoma. And last year I went through a transplant just about this time, a year ago. And uh, after the transplant, a couple of weeks after the transplant, I almost died. I went into oh. a, a coma and preserved by the grace of God. And one of the things I think about often and I speak about now is what would God have said to me? How would I have presented myself before the righteousness of God? I suppose the thing that most comes to mind for me is what would I answer if God asked me what I did for the poor and the downtrodden? Did I give the cup of cold water? Did I give the piece of bread? And I think about that in terms of world missions. I mean, there are parts of the world, I think about the 1040 window, for example, where there are some 1.6 billion people, many of whom have yet to hear the message of Christ, many of them who do not have clean water. Can you speak to that issue from your vantage point? Yeah, I think um, I personally think about what even happening in America, you know, how you have injustice abounding and poor people, or not poor people, but you have people who are impoverished and have been put in positions uh, that have not been equitable. And I think about the duty of Christians for us to fight for justice and fight for oppressed people, and not only just to speak out about it, but to actively do something about it, you know, whether that's how we vote how we speak about people or what we are willing to acknowledge. And and so I I think God cares about it because it all has to do with our neighbor, right? God cares a lot about (laughs) love. And I don't want to be the kind of Christian who has all these gifts, you know, who, but becomes just a clanging gong because I did not love people. And I think that's scary and it's easy to do. 
uh, because we can sometimes assume that being biblically orthodox, that that somehow makes us righteous or that somehow means that we've done enough. But man, my orthodoxy should lead me to be orthopraxis in that I should be living out what it is that I believe in that I quote. And, and that's hard, but the Holy Spirit can help us. Yeah, I love the emphasis that you have, and you've mentioned this a couple of times in the podcast, and you, you certainly mention it in the book as well. It's the theme of Romans chapter 13, where you take the two great commandments, love God and love neighbor, and the whole of that is wrapped up in loving your neighbor, because if you love your neighbor, it's an indication that you truly love God. Yep. That's it. You said it. You know, Jackie, I will tell you, I have never met you personally, but just hearing your voice and reading your book, I can truly say I love you and I appreciate the gift that God has given you. Thank you, Mr. Hank. I appreciate that. And your book, Gay God, oh my goodness. Oh, you did it. I just did it. I just did it. You know, you got me with all the G's. I have to say, <laughs> gay, <alliteration>. girl, <laughs> gay Girl, Good God. That book is, again, a book of the month. You can get your copy for your support of the ministry of the Christian Research Institute, the Bible Answer Man broadcast, the Hank Unplugged podcast, uh, 24-7 outreaches around the world. It's available for your support. You can get the book in a number of different ways. You can acquire your copy via the mail at Box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, zip code 28271. You can also check it out on the web at equip.org. Once again, my deepest appreciation to you for writing this book, Jackie, and for this wonderful podcast. Thank you. I appreciate you for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure, and thank you for tuning in to this edition of Hank Unplugged. Look forward to seeing you on the next podcast in just a little while. So long for now.